Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining this afternoon's uh, webinar. I give the floor to Aliu Dia, who will facilitate uh, today's event. Thank you, and Aliu Dia, the floor is yours. Bonjour à tous. Uh, bonjour à tous. Je suis le docteur uh, Aliou Dia, directeur des programmes de santé à l'école, santé scolaire au niveau du ministère de l'Éducation nationale au Sénégal. Bienvenue à tous les participants et, et con, participantes et, confer, et conférenciers. Nous sommes très heureux de vous avoir parmi nous aujourd'hui. Nous avons un programme très riche axé sur un thème qui présente beaucoup d'intérêt, mais qui est rarement exploré en détail lors de ces événements. L'adéquation nutritionnelle et la qualité de la nourriture scolaire est la façon d'y s'y rendre. Au Sénégal, à travers le programme d'amélioration de la qualité, de l'équité et de la transparence paquet, 2018-2030, l'alimentation scolaire est identifiée par le gouvernement comme un levier majeur pour permettre à davantage d'enfants d'âge scolaire d'accéder à une éducation de qualité dans un environnement protecteur et sain. Le programme présidentiel de cantine scolaire PPCS cible prioritairement les zones rurales et les zones périurbaines défavorables afin d'assurer de meilleures conditions d'apprentissage et de réussite scolaire. Cette vision Cette vision entre en droite ligne avec l'engagement de l'Union africaine qui a adopté l'approche alimentation scolaire sur la production locale comme un instrument clé pour atteindre les objectifs d'accès à l'école pour chaque fille et chaque garçon tout en réduisant les disparités liées à la pauvreté. Et ce, en lien avec les orientations de la stratégie continentale de l'éducation pour l'Afrique 2016-2025 et de l'agenda 2063 pour le développement de l'Afrique. L'émergence de la pandémie COVID-19 ainsi que les défis urgents en matière de développement ont mis en évidence le rôle essentiel de l'alimentation scolaire, en particulier des repas scolaires fournis aux écoliers vulnérables. La perturbation de la fermeture des écoles dans le monde ont eu un impact négatif non seulement sur le droit des enfants à l'éducation, mais aussi sur le droit à une amélioration et à une nutrition adéquate. Maintenir et augmenter la qualité nutritionnelle des repas est impératif pour soutenir l'alimentation des enfants et de leurs familles, non seulement pendant la période de stabilité, mais aussi en tant que réponse essentielle pendant les crises et après les, le rétablissement. L'accent mis sur la qualité et la durabilité ne devrait pas être une fondamentale. Aujourd'hui, nous entendons parler des impacts de l'alimentation, du contenu de l'alimentation et des repas scolaires en particulier, aux priorités nutritionnelles des enfants, de la nécessité de veiller à ce que les éléments clés du système alimentaire local soient mis en compte lors de la conception et de la mise en œuvre des normes en la matière dont les différents pays ont adopté ces normes et des conseils sur l'évolution des circonstances et de nouvelles crises. 
C'est ce que je voulais dire dans l'introduction et passer la parole à notre première panéliste. Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to address this event focusing on nutrition standards for school food. I want to thank the government of Japan for hosting the Nutrition for Growth event, which brings governments together to achieving better nutrition res results. I also want to congratulate the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Food Programme and the World Health Organization for bringing this topic to the table. Dear friends, school meals are much more than just a plate of food. When done right, school meals programs can support local agriculture, improve health, nutrition, education, make communities more resilient, promote gender equality, provide jobs and teach children about the importance of sustainable lifestyles and healthy diets. This year, Finland and France, in close collaboration with member states from north to south, the WFP and many other partners built a global schools meals coalition to ensure that every child receives a nutritious and healthy meal in school by 2030. The school meals coalition was launched in September during the Food Systems Summit with more than 60 member countries and more joining every day. I made a personal commitment to act as global school feeding champion, reaching out to partners and advocating for programs worldwide. Governments do recognize that recovering from the pandemic and building a more sustainable and resilient world will require policies that help tackle several challenges at once. We must think systematically. School meal programs are one of those systemic solutions. In Finland, free of charge school meals have been provided since the 1940s, initially to address post-war poverty and malnutrition. Later, the national school meal system has proven to be an, an investment in the future and in the economic and social welfare of the whole society. And therefore, uh, from our own experience, priority should be given to maintaining and increasing the nutrition quality of meals to support the diets of children and their families. The focus on nutrition quality and sustainability should not be an afterthought of school meal programs and policies, but rather one of the fundamental aims. The event today is specifically about the issue of quality. We will hear about how countries have made sure children get food that is safe, healthy and nutritious according to their needs. It is also important to discuss how local food systems are considered when designing and implementing nutrition standards. We will also hear from a young activist and hear her plea for free quality meals for children. The bottom line, in my opinion, is finding new ways that improve the quality of diets of school children, thus directly, directly contributing to the goals of the global school meals coalition. I hope this event contributes to achieving our ambitious goals for the benefit of our children and their future. Thank you so much for your attention. Arigato gozaimasu. Merci, merci, Monsieur Skinari, de cette, de cette vidéo que nous avons entendue. Et nous allons passer au second présentateur, au second présentateur Carmen. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. 
My name is Carmen Burbano. I'm the director of the World Food Programs School-Based Programs Division. And it's really a pleasure to be here today also following Minister Vilis Ginari, the uh, Minister of Development Cooperation of Finland. Uh, before I start, I just wanted to mention, because I see in the chat a lot of you uh, still struggling with the interpretation, I just want to give you a tip in the bottom right-hand corner of your uh, of your screen, you have a, a little button that says interpretation. If you click there, you can choose your, your language. Anyway, let me, let me just start. The organizers have asked me to explain a little bit more. What is this School Meals Coalition that Minister Skinari was talking about? In fact, earlier this year, in the context of the Food System Summit, 61 countries joined with more than 55 partners to join this really global call to action. So to start, let me, let me tell you where that coalition comes from and what the story is. Before the pandemic, we had information that 388 million children were receiving meals in schools. And if we can go to the first slide, you can see a map of what this looks like. What, basically what it looked like before the pandemic is that we had unprecedented global reach of school meals programs worldwide. This was the largest safety net supporting children in the world. And as you can see here, almost every country had sorted this out, of course, with different levels of coverage. But in a way, this was a massive, massive safety net. We also have information, and this all comes from WFP State of School Feeding Worldwide publication, that countries not only had established and, uh, and uh, established this, this massive safety net, but also in the course of the last eight years, they had institutionalized these programs. These programs had 80% uh, uh, of countries had national policies or laws associated to school feeding. 90% of the funding for the programs uh, worldwide was coming from domestic budgets. Although in low income countries, we still had a problem of, of an over-reliance on donors and on international organizations. And we also have information that before the pandemic, these programs were not just about meals. They were actively integrated with other health and nutrition interventions. So if we go to the second slide, we can see that 90% um, of the governments were also implementing school meals alongside other health and nutrition interventions. And what you can see here in this particular graph is that any any of the marks in blue, basically, if you look at all countries, something like 90% of the countries were implementing school meals programs alongside uh, between three and seven interventions. These could be, for example, water and sanitation. It could be supplementation. It could be deworming. It could be vaccinations and other kinds of uh, school health and nutrition complementary approaches. So what we really saw before the pandemic is that these programs were being consolidated, they were being improved in terms of their quality and they were expanding globally. Now the pandemic hit, as we all know, and 90% of the children in the world were sent home, education systems effectively collapsed. And with that collapse came the collapse of this massive safety net. So if we go to the next slide, this is what the world looked like last year. 370 million children lost access to meals. This is coming out of WFP's monitoring of the effects of the pandemic on school meals and school-based services for children. And this basically smashed a decade of progress in, in, this, in this safety net. Based out of this and out of this experience in 2020, France and Finland, as you saw in the video, came together to say, we need to do something. These programs are really key for pandemic recovery and for response for four main reasons. If we go to the next slide, we can see that countries were convinced that these programs go really far beyond the plate of food. These are investments that economically can give us at least $9 in return for every dollar that it's invested in these programs. And this is because of four main reasons. One, as I was saying, is because they are a primary social protection measure around the world. They support disparities, they eliminate disparities, they support specifically vulnerable households with income, indirect income. They are also really important education tools. They provide uh, the incentive for children, especially girls, to go to school, but also they support and aid learning. 
There's a third sector that's also very much involved in this, which is the agriculture sector. When these programs are combined with local purchase, they provide markets to farmers, they create jobs locally, and in general, they provide more sustainable food systems all around. And finally, a health and nutrition benefit, which is directly associated with better eating habits, with tackling hunger and undernutrition, micronutrient deficiencies, but also increasingly overweight obesity and just the general problems that come from children not having the right nutrition habits early in life. These programs can help tackle all of those things simultaneously, becoming really a powerful platform for community development. So based on that and based on that conv conviction, Governments came together and in September launched the School Meals Coalition. Let me show you what it's about. In the next slide, you have the goal of the coalition. The goal of countries that came together, this is a government-led coalition, was that every child have the opportunity to receive a healthy and nutritious meal in school by 2030. This is an ambitious goal. It's a global goal because governments felt that this applies both to high-income, middle-income, and low-income countries across the board. Now, three particular objectives were chosen. One, which was really about restoring what we had before the pandemic. We really need to go back to the coverage uh, and, and supporting uh, children that were receiving these meals before and that lost access to them as we open up schools safely. The second objective had to do with reaching the children that were being missed even before the pandemic. We know that there were at, at least three, uh, 73 million children that were missing out on school meals even before the pandemic. These are in low-income countries. And so the second objective is really about pooling resources and support for low-income countries to be able to achieve at least the minimum levels of coverage that are needed for children in these settings. And the third objective applies across the board and really is the focus, I think, of the meeting today is about quality, is about how these programs can become truly uh, the platform that we all hope they can be, including better and more nutritious food, including better and healthier environments for children in schools, and including the connection to all of these complementary approaches on school health and nutrition, and of course, better nutrition standards for these meals in countries. Let me just go really quickly through a few more slides to, to show you what the coalition is really about. Here you have the 61 countries that have joined you can see that they belong to almost to all the regions of the world. And you could see that they are from all income levels. So this really illustrates what I was saying that countries across the board have seen the value of implementing domestically these programs, but also supporting other countries to do the same. And they're not alone. Even though governments lead the coalition, they are supported in the next slide, we can see that by uh, 58 partners that have signed the Declaration of Support. So if you can share with us the next slide, please. Uh, so many partners, too difficult, of course, to name them all. So that's why we also always put them in the, in the slide. Uh, UN agencies, NGOs, academia, think tanks, multilateral organizations, foundations, regional bodies, et cetera. The list actually goes on and on because partners are joining every day. And the role of these partners is really to support governments, both at the global level, at the regional level, and at the country level to achieve the goals of the coalition. Now, let me end by saying that one of the most important aspects of the coalition are the initiatives that were launched to support governments achieve these goals and to address some of the major bottlenecks that we see on the ground. So let's go to the last slide. And let me tell you about the five initiatives. The first one is a research consortium that was launched in May of this year, led by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. This initiative is specifically designed to have academia come together and support decision makers in countries with better evidence for better decision making. So this is really geared towards countries with bringing evidence to the forefront of those decisions. A financing task force led by the Global Education Commission was designed particularly to find more sustainable sources of funding financing for these programs in low-income countries. A peer-to-peer -peer community of best practice led by the government of Germany 
to help governments share with each other their experiences with these programs. A fourth initiative, a monitoring and data initiative led by WFP, which is going to establish a global database for school meals and issue a worldwide report every two years to track progress. And a fifth initiative on advocacy and outreach. I'm stopping there because I can see my time is just about to be over, but just to say that the, the topic of this, of this meeting, the issue of nutrition standards is intimately related Merci. to the goals of the coalition and also to the initiatives. Thank you Merci. so much. Merci beaucoup. Nous allons passer au second présentateur. Catherine, vous avez la parole. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. So hello to all. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you to everyone who made the side event happen and it's a great pleasure to be part of this collaborative event. Um, I am not sure, I think my slides are gonna come up, there you go. So I'll talk about school food and nutrition standards more broadly following Carmen's talk and provide insights from WHO to the guideline development uh, process on school food and nutrition policies. Next slide, please. So you might know the next slide that's going to come up shortly. Um, why focus on schools? Uh, Carmen talked about it already. We know that optimal nutrition throughout the life course is central to health and development. And that nutritional well-being of children and adolescents is crucial, for example, to maximize children's own intellectual potential and school performance and to secure the health of future generations. So schools are really key settings for health. The recent WHO UNESCO a publication on global standards to make every school a health promoting school, for example, has one of the standards saying that school policies must ensure a safe environment for all members of the school community. So in line with this standard, it is critical to ensure that the school food environment helps address all forms of malnutrition. This is, of course, not without challenges. And a key challenge for a global approach or global guidance on school food nutrition policies um, and what schools can do for children's nutrition and food system transformation is the double burden of malnutrition. Next slide, please. So while undernutrition, of course, remains a global public health concern, rates of overweight and obesity among children under five and of school-aged children um, are on the rise. So 18% of school-aged children and adolescents are now overweight and overweight and obesity in childhood and adolescents are of course associated with adverse health consequences later in life. So when we speak about school food and nutrition standards, we as a public health community need to ensure that children have access to both adequate and nutritious food at all times, including as much as possible, also in times of crises, whether caused by conflict, disease outbreaks or disasters. Next slide, please. So over the years, tremendous effort has been made to improve the quality of school meals, but we still come across recipes that may have high levels of salt or that do not specify the preferred fats and oils that are healthier. And as we heard already from Minister Skinari, the health and safety of school food should not be an afterthought. We need to have a change in mindset but um, we might face some resistance as improving the quality of meals in schools may mean, for example, reviewing or revising existing contracts with suppliers, caterers, and vendors, or grant agreements that may apply, for example, to food donations. Next slide, please. So what do we actually refer to when we talk about school food um, and nutrition standards? This can be a set of criteria, standards, rules, that specify what food will be allowed um, to be served or sold in specific public settings like schools and are purchased by the government. Of course, it may also apply to food donations. These may be nutrient-based or food-based criteria or other criteria related, uh, for example, to the preparation methods or service modalities. They can apply to foods um, or beverages. Next slide, please. So here are a few um, examples of nutrient-based standards, maybe one um, where schools require that all processed or ultra-processed food products must contain less than 10% of total energy from fat, um, as is available in El Salvador. 
um, or procurement agencies. Uh, here, the example um, of the Indian Integrated Child Development Scheme and the Midday Meal Scheme are advised not to procure and use trans fat containing fats and oil, vanaspati, in the preparation of food. Um, and they should also desist from procuring food products prepared using margarine or baking, uh, uh, bakery shortenings. So the, in the case of India, nearly 116 million beneficiaries received this scheme per day, which shows the impact it can have. So looking at food-based standards, sorry, they're swapped in the order on the slide. Um, looking at food-based standards, prohibiting sweet and sweetened drinks, including soft drinks, juices, diet beverages, slushies, et cetera, et cetera, can be banned um, for the sale in canteens, kiosks, or vending machines in schools, as is being done in Israel. Um, or the sale of energy dense, low nutrient density foods um, around schools can also be restricted as in the case of Korea. Next slide, please. So this uh, next slide, which is gonna come up shortly, um, shows data from the WHO Global Database on Implementation of Nutrition Actions. Uh, thanks to my colleague Kaya for putting this together. Um, the scope of school-based uh, food and beverage measures, which is reported by 81 member states in that survey, showing that most measures were actually about foods and beverages offered at school lunches um, or other meals, followed by measures on foods and beverages sold in cafeterias or vending machines. Here, about half of the responses were from high-income countries, which is a concern because most of the information we have on this, um, the school uh, standards in general comes from, from high-income countries. 16 low and middle-income countries reported on measures. Next slide, please. So I'll just now spend the last couple of minutes remaining to share information on WHO guideline work and forthcoming guidelines on school food nutrition policies. So the objectives of the guidelines are to guide member states in the development and implementation of effective evidence-informed school food and nutrition policies, to enable advocacy for implementation of these policies, to create healthy school food environments, and of course, to facilitate development of healthy dietary patterns among all children. So the target population includes children in preschool, primary and secondary school. So all children above the age of two. Uh, the WHO guideline development work is supported by an external group of experts. And this guideline development group, the GDG, uh, for this guideline defined the focus to be on five interventions that influence the school food environment, including standards or rules that determine the quality of food served and sold around schools. The five interventions that you can see um, on the screen were defined building on the results of the scoping review that was commissioned, but also considering recommendations recently published by WHO and UNESCO on school health services, which also cover, for example, the provision of nutrition education or screening for nutritional problems. Next slide, please. So WHO commissioned one systematic review on the effects of policies or interventions that influence the school food environment, including standards. The challenge, as I alluded to earlier, is that global guideline uh, recommendations on standards need to consider all forms of malnutrition. The focus on um, evaluation studies has actually been quite narrow, looking at very specific questions, for example, at whether nutrition standards increase the availability of healthy uh, food at schools compared to not having standards, or whether nutrition standards impact the availability of uh, healthy beverages in, in schools. So the impact of having nutrition standards um, was then assessed on a set of outcomes of interest that was also defined by the guideline development group. And these outcomes of interest are also quite complex. They include consumption of healthy foods, non-alcoholic beverages in schools, consumption of discretionary foods, nutrient or calorie content of food, dietary intake, but also educational outcomes. Importantly, the systematic review team encountered several data limitations, challenges, and research gaps, including uh, the heterogeneity of data of outcome measures of the target population, the target foods included in standards, and most of the evidence coming, for example, from high income countries, and that the evidence is based on high risk of bias studies. So unfortunately, the systematic review is not yet finalized, um, so we can't uh, share the, the data. 
But um, as I'll show on the next slide, we have um, conducted and published reviews of contextual factors to support the guideline development process. When developing um, a WHO guideline and its recommendation, um, explicit consideration must be given to decision criteria, the contextual factors, when moving from the evidence on the impact of recommendations um, to, to the actual um, recommendation at the end. So the factors considered in this review were values, uh, resource implications, equity, human rights, feasibility, and acceptability. So we, view, we reviewed 350 publications um, in total and much was on nutrition standards. So looking at resource implications, for example, um, it depends on whether a country develops a new standard or revises standards whether the focus is to increase the uptake of the standard, uh, for example, from just primary schools to all schools, or if new standards, uh, for example, require that certain foods are served. So importantly, um, standards are in line with uh, human rights. So some of the countries actually that, that have published information on this, um, their laws are driven by a rights-based approach. Um, for example, Brazil, Honduras, Paraguay, they have a very strong rights-based approach. Um, so interestingly, we also found inequalities may remain after implementation of the standards. Um, I'll quickly go to the next slide and then wrap up. So I'll, I'll skip yep, over this to show that nutrition standards are largely acceptable by a range of stakeholders. And the final slide, um, just with a couple of key messages uh, so showing that we do need to uh, focus on schools, uh, that school food policies need to be coherent, and that we need to strengthen the evidence base. And Carmen pointed um, already to the Global Research Consortium, which will play an important role also in strengthening the evidence base for standards. Sorry for going a couple of seconds over time. Thank you for your attention. Merci. Merci, Catherine, de cette belle présentation. Et le, la, le, le, prochain, le prochain orateur, c'est Nancy et Melissa. Vous avez la parole. Thank you, Dr. Dia, for allowing me the floor. Colleagues, so far we've already heard about why improving nutrition adequacy of school meals and school food in general is, is really essential for school children's diet quality. And we've also heard some of the evidence around that and some examples, some specific examples of food and nutrition standards. Now in the next presentation, we're gonna take a deeper dive into the development of standards. Standards not only to ensure that school meals respond to the nutrition needs of children and adolescents, um, but also to diversify the, the school food basket, to strengthen the pathways for meeting nutrition objectives of school meal programs, to ensure that children and adolescents are entitled to the same benefits in terms of nutrition adequacy, to help promote healthier food practices in children and adolescents, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, to help operationalize children and adolescents' right to an adequate food in schools. Now, I come from FAO and FAO in partnership with WFP, guided by the UN Interagency Consultative Group and with generous funding from the German Federal Ministry of Food and Agriculture, has embarked on a process of developing a methodology to help countries around the world set their own context-specific nutrition standards for school food with a real focus on school meals. Now, the initiative is a direct response to a need that was expressed by countries. And it's also it was reflected in the outcome of a comprehensive review on nutrition guidelines and standards for school meals that was conducted in 33 low and middle income countries. The results of the review identified that one main gap was the lack of guidance and validated evidence based processes for countries to derive their guidelines and standards. So now certainly the existence of standards and guidelines is not enough. It's not enough to guarantee that the food available in schools responds to all the nutritional needs of children, nor does it guarantee that food is actually being prepared and consumed in the intended way, let alone that it's improving nutrition levels in children. However, standards and guidelines comprise a necessary step that demonstrates a commitment towards setting that minimum quality for school food. And it can really be 
an effective tool to improve local food system if implemented in a coherent and multi-sectorial way. So now let's jump into that presentation. And to do so, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Melissa Vargas, who's gonna present the details of this process and the expected features of the methodology. Melissa, over to you. Thank you, thank you very much, Nancy, and thank you, everybody, colleagues. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, this methodology that uh, Nancy has just mentioned. And um, we had also a definition, since Catherine um, kindly shared with us the definition of nutrition guidance and stuff, uh, I will skip this. Um, so as Nancy mentioned, um, this work uh, has come from a, a very uh, valid need expressed by countries, expressed by experts and researchers, and it came very clear with a report that we did in um, 2018 with 33 low and middle income countries. We have also been discussing with several UN agencies in a community of practice and uh, the, the need for a, a specific methodology with a step-by-step -step guidance came from these discussions. So we have here, why is um, a validated methodology needed? We know, uh, and it's very nice that we uh, come after that Queen's presentation because uh, she mentioned what are the, the, the limitations of research in this area, and it really depends on that on how the standards were uh, derived and designed and implemented. So we know that we need step-by-step -step guidance, simple guidance that can be followed in a, in a systematic way. Uh, we know that standards for school food and particularly for school meals are not one size fits all. We understand that the, the problems are different, the context is very different, so we know we need a process, a methodology, and not to set international standards for all. We need to account for different types of data, which I will explain to you in a minute. We need to adapt for contextual factor, factors and situations of food systems, of food supply chains, and the procurement mechanisms. We need to ensure that the process is iterative because we know that in some occasions what is a presented or designed nutrition standards may not be feasible in terms of the actual meals or in terms of because the procurement mechanisms do not allow for a buying specific ingredients or that the supply is um, not enough or not appropriate to uh, comply with such standards. And we also need a process that relies on modeling, on testing in each part, uh, in different parts of the process, so we can make informed decision making. Uh, so this is just um, one part of um, what Nancy presented. We have this project um, in partnership with WFP and also supported by uh, WHO, UNICEF, and other agencies as consultative groups. And the, uh, the project is going to be piloted in Cambodia and Ghana. The main aim is to develop this global methodology in order for countries to set standards that are feasible, that are uh, food systems based, and uh, that are context specific. What are the, the planned elements of this methodology? We first we are working within specific guiding principles. We want to ensure that all the process of planning this methodology is guided by the following: that is iterative, as I mentioned, uh, that is systematic, that we have a specific processes that are conducted in a transparent way, that it should be multi-sectoral because we know that there is not one sector that can really uh, ensure to have these standards that are appropriate for children's needs, but are also feasible in in terms of supply, in terms of procurement, in terms of acceptability, and in terms of targeting. So it really needs to involve different sectors. We want to ensure that this process is participatory. We cannot uh, keep um, having the main right bearers, the children, the students, the school systems that are not implementing such standards out of the process or only at the end of the process. We need to be transparent. We need to ensure that there is documentation how this specific decisions were made or why adjustments were made. We need to ensure that this, uh, that this uh, methodology and the final um, output of the methodology is based on evidence on, and on actual needs, not on assumptions. And also we need something that is flexible, because as we know with the current COVID pandemic, the school closures were a big hit. And we, uh, we, this is one of the main aspects that we needed to ensure that it's adaptable so we can really uh, modify these standards according to the situation, to the context crisis situations. 
And of course, we need a process that allows for continuous improvement, meaning that we have data uh, that can fit into the process in a regular way so we can ensure if these uh, standards are working in improving the quality or not. Uh, we are intending to have a, a process that involves that has different uh, types of data feeding into it. And um, of course, we will definitely have a nutrition status of children, be it anthropometric data, biochemical or functional parameters. Uh, we need to, uh, to understand the energy and the nutrient environments of the children, the age groups that we are targeting. We need to have individual food consumption data, which is quite limited in school children and adolescents specifically. We also need to have uh, information on, and data on food behaviors that are going to affect the acceptability or um, the effects of such standards. And of course, we need data on food competition, which is growing every day more, but they're still limited in many parts of the world. At the same time... Melissa, I'm afraid, sorry, I, I need to interrupt you, but interpreters cannot, uh, in, cannot hear you properly. Would it be possible okay. to you? Maybe we can... Um, Move your, uh, your section to the next one and uh, go on with the next speaker while we find the heads while we find okay. the headset. Thank you. Okay. Merci, 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 Melissa. Et nous allons introduire le prochain orateur, Bruno, uh, qui va nous présenter un cas du Brésil. Vous avez la parole. Muito obrigado. Uh, eu estou vendo aqui que o tempo não foi zerado, é só para a gente ter um controle. Tá com... uh, bom, eu. Bom dia, boa tarde, boa noite, dependendo do lugar onde você estiver nesse momento. Eu estou falando em nome da da Rede Sustentável de Alimentação Escolar da América Latina e do Caribe, que é liderada pelo Brasil, junto com, com a FAO Brasil, uh, desde, uh, desde já há algum tempo. E também falo uh, em nome do governo brasileiro, do Ministério da Educação, o Fundo Nacional do Desenvolvimento da Educação, onde o Programa de Alimentação Escolar Brasileiro está inserido e onde nós fazemos a gestão do programa para apresentar um link entre é, os avanços que o Brasil tem estabelecido na dimensão da nutrição do Programa de Alimentação Escolar com a rede é, de alimentação escolar sustentável que a gente uh, vem desenvolvendo já há alguns anos na América Latina e no Caribe e tentar encontrar uma, um ponto de convergência entre a contribuição, entre a rede e a coalizão e a contribuição é, que o Brasil, uh, liderando essa rede, pode trazer para a coalizão e, da mesma forma, é, por outro lado, se beneficiar de uma a, ação a, coletiva, conjunta. Bom, então, o, a rede de alimentação a, escolar ela está dentro da, da iniciativa das Nações Unidas, da ONU, da, da década de, de ação da, da alimentação, e ela foi constituída de uma maneira muito espontânea, porque o Brasil tem um projeto de cooperação com, com a FAO, é, que é renovada há muitos anos, desde 2008, 2009, é, os primeiros projetos foram estabelecidos de cooperação Sul-Sul, e a partir daí tem o Brasil é, trabalha muito próximo dos governos da América Latina e do Caribe na tentativa de contribuir na implementação de ações de é, programas de alimentação escolar é, nesses países. É, então, em 2018, essa essa movimentação de cooperação, ela se estrutura, se desenha como uma rede espontânea que surge de dentro para fora, a rede de alimentação escolar, que é sustentada pelos princípios e pelos aspectos que a gente já vinha construindo e estabelecendo ao longo, ao longo dos anos, e em, em cujos é, princípios o programa de alimentação escolar brasileiro foi constituído também. São os princípios do programa brasileiro que a gente leva para os países, porque eles são, de fato, os mesmos que hoje a gente 
encontra nos objetivos do desenvolvimento sustentável é, em termos de redução da pobreza, de geração de renda, é, de redução de combate à fome e de link entre essas ações de proteção social e uma, as ações é, de uh, fortalecimento, estabelecimento de padrões de qualidade para uma alimentação sustentável. Então, o, dentro do período da pandemia, né, e aí para quem não está familiarizado com o programa brasileiro, é, o, Brasil, o programa atende a 43 milhões de estudantes, é universal dentro do, do Brasil, atendendo a todas as escolas públicas, com um orçamento em torno de 800 milhões de dólares por ano. E 30% no mínimo desse recurso é repassado para agricultores familiares e grupos sociais mais vulneráveis. E vem daí a redução da pobreza no Brasil, no campo especialmente, é, durante um período quando, no ápice desse processo, o Brasil saiu do mapa da fome em 2014, 2015, é, no mapa da fome é, da ONU. Então, o, os princípios de como realizar isso eles já são conhecidos. Né? Mas, para além dessa, desse, desse link com a agricultura familiar, há princípios da nutrição que são é, bem rigorosos. Então, é, durante a pandemia, o, é, nós conseguimos aprovar uma resolução que estabeleceu padrões, estándares nutricionais ainda mais rigorosos para alimentação escolar. É, em 2020, houve uma resolução, uma normativa é, do programa voltado para o atendimento de emergência, que é para permitir a distribuição dos alimentos, mesmo com as escolas fechadas, mas veio em junho de 2020 essa resolução que vinha sendo construída há dois ou três anos num processo participativo, com muitos atores envolvidos, desde nutricionistas, pesquisadores de universidades, agricultores familiares, indígenas, que puderam vir ao governo, ao FNDE, e discutir os termos dessa resolução, até que, mesmo dentro da pandemia, e nós entendemos que, na realidade, essa resolução, com os padrões de maior é, é, de, de índices mais rigorosos para uma alimentação saudável seria é, seria importantíssimo seria um instrumento que os gestores e os nutricionistas teriam em mão para poder garantir não só o acesso à alimentação de um grupo da população que estava sem acesso mas o acesso garantindo uma alimentação saudável né? então tem índices de 75% por exemplo, de alimentos frescos, uma obrigatoriedade, a é, produtos é, que são completamente proibidos, como refrigerantes, a, açúcar é um tipo de produto completamente proibido em creches para crianças até três anos, por exemplo. E essa resolução ela foi construída com base, é, entre outros documentos, no Guia Alimentar da População Brasileira, que é um documento do Ministério da saúde, com o qual o Ministério da Educação tem é, uma integração, uma parceria muito grande, e esse guia popular da alimentação, da, da população, esse guia alimentar da população brasileira, ele estabelece a, as orientações para uma alimentação saudável, e o programa da, da alimentação escolar, ele segue esse guia é, no, no que é possível. Então, nós conseguimos, por exemplo, mesmo colocando em estándares muito rigorosos, que a própria indústria se adaptasse às normas do programa de alimentação escolar. É, recebemos a, 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 o setor privado, conversamos, dialogamos com, com a indústria e grandes corporações dentro do Brasil se propuseram a reduzir níveis de açúcar, de sódio, para poder continuar vendendo é, dentro do percentual permitido fora da agricultura familiar, naturalmente, é, para o Estado, para, para as escolas. Né? Então, é, a política pública a, ainda tem uma força, dependendo é, da estratégia, de uma mudança no próprio é, setor privado, na indústria, dependendo de como isso 
seja feito é, com muita sensibilização, muita, muita conversa, enfim. É, então, temos exemplos de, é, de, de alguns padrões que aparentemente eram muito difíceis de ser cumpridos, por exemplo, é, se oferece a alimentação mais saudável e o estudante recusa, por exemplo, porque ele está acostumado a comer uma comida com índice de sal ou de açúcar é, maiores é, em casa ou na rua. E nós conseguimos resolver esses problemas, esses desafios com uma grande ferramenta, que é, são as ações de alimentação, de educação alimentar é, nutricional. Essas é, atividades de educação alimentar e nutricional, elas são muito pensadas dentro do contexto da própria comunidade. É, os estudantes são inseridos nessas atividades para que eles se envolvam e, de fato, mudem os seus hábitos e, e, e mudem os hábitos das famílias. Um exemplo disso é uma atividade de educação alimentar e nutricional em uma escola indígena, por exemplo, que motivou os estudantes, crianças indígenas, a conversarem com seus avós e lembrarem que tipo de preparação os avós costumavam comer é, quando eram crianças e que já não existiam mais. E as crianças aprenderam a fazer aquelas preparações tradicionais da cultura dos próprios avós, dos seus ancestrais, e depois levaram essas preparações para casa, para os avós experimentarem. E houve, naturalmente, todo um processo é, lúdico, é, lírico, afetuoso, é, em que, que trouxe a cultura e a tradição é, daquela população para dentro da escola, de volta para casa. E, e, e foi um exemplo de atividade de educação alimentar e nutricional que transformou os hábitos alimentares das crianças, por exemplo, dos estudantes. Eles passaram a gostar da sua própria alimentação. Então, a atividade de educação alimentar e nutricional, é, só para complementar, é, no Brasil, um dos principais... Well, Dr. Bira, uh, connects... Ah, me... bonjour. <laughs> ok, thank you. Dr. Bira, oui. Merci, 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 Bruno. Uh, on va passer la parole à Robert. Robert, merci. Vous avez la parole. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, thanks. If I can have my um, presentation in the first slide. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about um, the history of uh, nutritional standards in the UK and how we've got to, to where we are right now. Um, I think the first thing to say is that all education policy in the UK has devolved. So there are different policies in place in the uh, all four countries uh, of the UK. Um, but Despite that, I think it's important to say that a pretty similar story could be told about all four countries. Um, I'm going to focus on England for the sake of time, um, but really all four countries have uh, school nutritional standards in place um, being enforced. Um, they've been updated at least within the last 15 years, but in most cases more recently. Um, in 2019, uh, both England and Northern Ireland held discussions or a consultation in the Northern Irish case about updating their standards that's been held up by the pandemic, but I think we can, uh, we can expect it uh, to resume once hopefully things are, are back to a more, a more stable situation. Uh, next slide, please. So to give you a bit of history, um, school nutritional standards in England um, are pretty long standing. Uh, they were introduced during the 1940s at the end of the Second World War, um, and we've had them almost all the time since. Um, there was a, a period in the 1980s and 1990s and the then Conservative government where uh, standards were withdrawn. This was part of a quite wide uh, program of deregulation on, on behalf of that government. Um, but when that government left office in 1997, the Labour government that came in reintroduced standards uh, quite soon in 2001, and we've had standards in place ever since uh, and been quite regularly reformed. Uh, during the early 2000s, there was quite a lot of concern in the UK about rising obesity levels, particularly amongst children, um, and that while schools were providing healthy options for children, um, they weren't being taken up. Uh, so this, the standards were reformed again um, towards 2009 um, to sort of try and combat uh, poor student choices really in their food. Uh, next slide, please. 
so since 2010, despite further political changes, um, the story has really continued with standards being revised um, and enforced with a, a school food plan in 2013, which decided to, uh, designed to give quite a comprehensive um, set of resources to schools to, to support them in providing healthy food, um, revised standards again in 2015, uh, and as I said, uh, further discussion in 2019 of, of reviewing those standards. Um, this is seen as quite an urgent issue. Um, we know that in England, um, around a third of children are either overweight or obese by the age of 11, um, and healthy school food is seen as a, a really useful way of combating that. Um, during the pandemic, however, um, talk of reform has been put on hold, and really the priority has been about upholding the standards. Uh, next slide, please. Um, to give you an idea of, of what the standards require, I think we've heard similar in previous talks. This is a long way from the full picture, um, but there's quite an emphasis on making sure that fruit and healthy food is available um, all across schools, that there are certain um, amounts of meat or poultry or uh, vegetarian equivalents that are um, available to students, say, three days a week, uh, and there are real limits on less healthy food. Um, sometimes that's kind of outright prohibitions, so there's no table salt um, served to uh, school pupils um, and sometimes it's just restrictions so uh, deep fried food might be served two days a week or as an option two days a week but no more um, so that's the, the type of approach that is taken uh, next slide please uh, i think it's important to say this is really um, part of a really wide program um, to support pupils and, and shape the way children eat in, in schools in, in England. Um, there are widely available um, free school meals for less affluent pupils. I think around a fifth of uh, pupils in England receive those free meals. Um, there are also breakfast clubs um, in, in some areas um, which have been found to improve uh, children's concentration, the behaviour and likelihood to attend school. Um, and there's now a national program in place to provide school meals uh, during the holidays. Um, this is something that's been a real point of controversy and focus in the UK during the pandemic, but really for a long time, um, people have worried that uh, when children aren't in school, particularly during the long summer holiday, they don't have nutrition, or some children don't have nutritional food available to them. Um, and there's been a series of pilot schemes to, to introduce a program to try and address this, um, and that now has been rolled out nationwide. Um, there is also um, something called uh, the, the Voluntary Schools Health Rating Scheme, which is kind of an accreditation. Um, it's not compulsory, but schools can uh, sign up to it, achieve that, that rating, and uh, that, that's sort of an advert that they are a school that, that provides nutritional food for the children who attend. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, to bring us right up to up to date. During the pandemic, um, as I guess, as a, a, again we heard earlier, um, a lot of schools in England have been closed to pupils for, for quite significant periods. Um, I've highlighted there the two main lockdown periods we've had uh, in um, in England, but even outside of those uh, periods, I think it's important to say that we've had a lot of school absences, uh, children out of school for, for different reasons, either because they've had COVID themselves or been in, you know, in contact with people who have, or if uh, a certain number of pupils in a, in a school year um, have COVID, then all the children will be sent home. So there really has been a lot of school absence, uh, as in, in most countries, I'm sure, um, during the pandemic. During the pandemic, schools have been expected to still provide meals um, to less affluent pupils. Um, this has been done in two main ways. Um, one is a voucher scheme. Uh, so that's uh, vouchers that parents can spend in supermarkets or to the value, um, it's about £15 a week, um, to the value of the, the food they would normally be receiving in school or food packages um, that have been provided directly um, from schools and delivered to parents' houses or, or through some, some scheme that the, uh, the school arranges, has been arranged locally. Uh, the next slide, please. Okay, so 
there have been quite a lot of problems, um, as you can imagine, that schools have faced uh, during the pandemic in, in setting up these schemes um, because of the ways that, in particular, the lockdown um, periods happened. Uh, things had to be done very quickly. Um, there were a lot of teething problems in, uh, in, in the introduction of, of how things were done. For instance, the vouchers maybe wouldn't work or they could only be used in certain supermarkets and things that had to be done quite quickly and then fixed quite quickly. Um, there was a lot of concern, particularly in early 2021, about the quality of school, school food parcels being sent home to pupils. This was a big social media controversy, people posting pictures of what they received and were not happy with. Um, and that was that very quickly became a, a, a matter for the government to to address. Um, and I think it's it, and, well, particularly at the start of the pandemic, uh, there was real concern about the implications for parents who might lose their jobs. Uh, and that led to real pressure for school meals to be provided during the school holidays, which for the most part, mostly through the voucher scheme, um, they have been. That's quite an innovation uh, in England. That's not something that had happened before 2020, but most of the school holidays that have taken place is then there has been some form of scheme um, to support pupils during the holidays. Uh, but perhaps the biggest challenge in terms of enforcing the standards is that through the voucher scheme, the, the, the nutritional standards simply aren't enforceable. Um, parents, you know, the government can't decide what parents buy um, uh, when they go for, you know, when they go to the supermarket to buy food. The government said they're a useful guide, uh, but really there's not been a way uh, to enforce those standards when children are out of school in anything like the way uh, that would happen if children were in school. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, uh, and to bring up to a close, uh, I think it's 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 important to say there's there's really widespread agreement now in the UK about the need for nutritional standards in schools um, for different countries of the UK, very different governments, but they all uh, agree on this. No, no, no policy is universal, but this is pretty close to it. Um, I think probably the two main areas of contention going forward are how do we provide healthy meals to children most in need, particularly during the school holidays and particularly when they're out of school. Um, and a huge point of contention in, in England is who should receive free school meals, uh, whether all children should receive free school meals, whether children should receive breakfast, whether we're catching the right pupils with the measures we have. Um, that's a big, a big point of contention. Uh, just quickly move on to my last slide. There's some documents um, that if you're interested in more of this, uh, what I've spoken about, then you can uh, you can look at use those and um, I'll give you a lot more information about the things I've touched on. Thank you. Merci, merci Robert. Nous allons passer. Merci Robert. Nous allons passer à la. Merci Robert. Nous allons passer à la dernière intervenante. Ok, Melissa. Donc uh, Melissa, vous avez la parole. Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me well? Wait. Yes. yes. Very well. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, these this technology issues. Okay, so as I was saying, and thank you very much, Robert, for your presentation. I think it, it was quite helpful to have it. Um, now we are we were talking about the types of data that should go that will feed into the methodology. And um, so we have also, since a lot of countries are moving in the direction of um, supporting their school meal programs and their school food to be more um, environmentally sustainable. We will also consider data on greenhouse gas emissions where available, definitely, uh, biodiversity data and other types of uh, um, environmental indicators, definitely um, prices, uh, as I mentioned, modeling, uh, modeling data, uh, food supply data and education data. So all of these uh, types of information and data will go into feed into the methodology. We don't need, we know that the majority of countries do not have uh, all of these comprehensive data, but the idea is that we offer solutions in the methodology and simpler steps or uh, more comprehensive steps depending on the type of data. Okay.
apart from this, we are also going to have key information in order to support the stakeholders who will do the def different de decisions along the way. For example, we will have information that are not normally considered at this step, like sociocultural norms related to food, uh, what are the prohibition prohibitions, cultural traditions, religion, uh, all of these that could really affect uh, the acceptability of the standards. Of course, the program objectives, the targets and modalities, many times uh, the projects do not have as the first objective to improve nutrition. So we definitely need to consider what are the aims of the, of the programs. Uh, of course, production and procurement possibilities and challenges. This is something important that is not often considered at this, um, this type of discussions. Um, environmental, social, and economic sustainability considerations, apart from the environment, what are the, the most vulnerable? Do we need to have different standards for those that are most vulnerable um, socioeconomically? Uh, what, are, what are the impacts of this uh, in, for example, a universal program? Uh, competitive foods, as Catherine was mentioning, uh, there are sometimes in country standards that um, define what type of foods uh, are allowed to be sold and other types of standards which are uh, defining what the meals that are provided to children should comply with. Sometimes there is a lot of incoherence between these two. Definitely, if the country has national food-based dietary guidelines that can guide uh, the type of food groups, for example, or the types of broader recommendations that should inform these standards. What are the main issues that we aim that the methodology should aim to address or at least account for? Factors that may affect regular provision of commodities, seasonality, issues of supply, um, climate impacts, uh, different types of other crises. Um, what are if if the operationalization of the nutrition guidelines and standards are not um, feasible because of the current procurement mechanisms? Um, as I mentioned, this if the nutrition guidelines and standards are not flexible or responsive enough to rapid changes like the ones we are experiencing now. Uh, regional differences, we cannot have very, very rigid standards because they really need to ensure that we account for regional differences in, uh, of course, the nutrition priorities of children, but also in what the food system can uh, supply. Uh, the context of implementation, if it's going to be, who is going to translate these standards into menus and meals? Is it going to be nutritionists, other professionals? Is it going to be the caterers themselves? This really depends on how you present the nutrition guidelines and standards. And then the, the issues of coherence. Um, I will skip this in, in the interest of time. So important considerations that we are going to, to take um, as we embark in this process. Uh, the supply and the procurement possibilities must be considered from the beginning of the process to set nutrition standards and not only afterwards as a mean of implementation. And then a balance needs to be reached between what is needed uh, from a nutrition point of view and what is feasible with the production a current or new procurement mechanisms we need to understand we cannot definitely we want to ensure that uh, the nutrition standards are the ones that get complied with and are perfectly acceptable and adequate for children but sometimes we understand that we need to have a gradual approach because we cannot uh, uh, comply with them with the current procurement and supply possibilities Definitely, we want to expand a little bit because the, the nutrition guidelines and standards are not just about uh, nutrient standards or food groups. They also can go into the number of meals to be provided, the timing of the meals, food preparation practices, the variation of menus in time, uh, how it's going to be operationalized, how complex or simple they are, and then the linkages with other standards. And then definitely we have implications of the nutrition guidelines and standards. Once they are set, we have implications on the capacity, of course, or that this needs to be also considered beforehand on the costs, on food safety, if we're introducing, for example, animal source foods, meal planning, preparation and distribution on the infrastructure and equipment. So we are aiming that all of this is considered during the whole process and it's an iterative process. And definitely monitoring and evaluation, including legal implications of such standards. Um, and just to close, I want to, you to keep in mind for this presentation is the existence, as Nancy mentioned, of standards by themselves is not enough, but it's a strong basis to improve children's diets. And the success of those standards depend, of course, on actual implementation, 
and complementary measures, but also on the richness of the process, because it can really spark a lot of um, insights in how to make these standards um, more compliant with to involve uh, children and parents to enhance acceptability and also to enhance the legal recognition. So I thank you very much. Merci, 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 Melissa. Uh, maintenant, on va passer à la dernière présentation. Christina, vous avez la parole. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me and thanks for listening for so long. So I'll try to be vibrant when I talk. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about youth and our relation to food, because um, I think within uh, the school meal space and the wider food campaigning space, adults are often guilty of um, talking so much about young people and children and not actually including them in the conversation. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, a little bit about my story. Um, I grew up in a food desert. I, I live in London and I had no idea about it. I grew up um, for 15 years without knowing what a food desert was, um, what it meant that I was living in an environment where I had no access to nutritious food. And it was only when I joined um, the organization that I'm with now, Bite Back 2030, that I actually understood um, the, the issue and I understood that I'm twice as likely to develop obesity I'm likely to die around 10 years earlier just because of um, the, the, the food that is available to me um, and with the free school meal campaign uh, in the UK I started it during the eighth week of lockdown um, because I, I was a recipient of free school meals when I was younger and so um, when I found out that the government wasn't um, deciding to um, ensure free school meal provisions over the uh, half term, over the holidays in, in the UK, I was shocked. It, it was a, you know, global pandemic. Um, families had no money coming in. There was no way of making income. And yet you're going to take away the one, you know, essential provision that allows for um, a child to eat. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I started the petition to um, change that and get the government to make a U-turn. It had uh, 400,000 signatures and uh, we essentially achieved the pro uh, pro provision over the May half term. And then Marcus Rashford took on the campaign over the summer holidays to ensure free school meals over the holidays. Um, and I also mentioned that I'm from Tigray in Ethiopia because um, my passion for food um, also stems from the fact that, you know, where I'm from, there's uh, many famines, there's always been um, agricultural issues and problems for so many different reasons. And so the value of food is very important to me personally. Um, next slide, please. So I mentioned Bite Back 2030, uh, where a youth led movement aiming to fight the injustices of the food industry. And um, we've set the date 2030 because we want to half child obesity by that year. Uh, we have one national youth board who's in the image there, um, and we've added on six new members, so we're now around 15 young people, and we've got two regional youth boards, one based in London and one based in Birmingham, and we're hoping to expand into um, different regions of the UK uh, in the next year or so. And I think the work that we do is so important because there is no other youth led movement like Fight Back within the food space. As I said before, I myself didn't know I was living in a food desert. I myself was, you know, the first person to talk about free school meals um, and actually try and get rid of the kind of stigma that's around the issue in the UK. Um, and that's shocking because free school meals has been an issue for, you know, the, the shame around it. and. Um, the, the lack of consistency in uh, nutrition and just the provision itself has been such an issue. And yet uh, young people are just not involved um, in the conversation and they don't feel empowered to talk about it. So I think our work is so crucial and our young people are so, so amazing. Um, our values, which we all um, discussed as a group together in our uh, training sessions, uh, we decided to use five words where real, resilient, respectful, fresh and energetic. And that's what we want to bring to every meeting we're in. And um, that's what we hope to convey and what we demand of our governments and the corporates and the world around us. 
Um, so yeah, we're a perfect example of how to get youth engaged in food. Uh, next slide, please. And so I'd want to run, I want to run through um, some of our campaigns. Um, the ones here are specifically to do with free school meals, although we span so many different um, so many different kind of topics to do with food. So there's sports sponsorship, for example, where um, one of my um, youth board members, uh, Jacob, he went to the English Cricket Board because there was a campaign called The 100 recently, a uh, sports cricket tournament called uh, The 100, where the athletes, their t-shirts were just crisp packets. Um, and it was it was so shocking to us, like they're just crisp packets and they're playing sports. And we know that those athletes themselves would never eat the food um, that they're advertising. And so um, I guess what I'm trying to say and what Bite Back is trying to say is that food and, and uh, nutrition isn't is, is beyond just a plate. It's everywhere. Right. The fact that we are bombarded by junk food and the fact that obesity, childhood obesity has become a thing now. It wasn't 50 years ago, it, it, it's a new um, issue. It's because it's not just about um, what, what we're eating, it's about how it's being advertised all around us. So we've had a junk food marketing campaign, we've had success in that, um, in getting the government to introduce a 9 p.m. watershed on TV and um, get them to ban online advertising by 2023. Um, and the ones here related to free school meals, um, we have our school food champions project where 480 pupils across the country, this just started up, um, so we're starting small, um, are taking part in uh, school food clubs where they talk about the food they eat at school and take action to make it healthier. And we've also had a don't hide what's inside campaign, which is more corporate facing. So though um, we, we get, you know, advertised to with all these massive companies some of them act like they're healthy you know they use halo um advertising which essentially means that um they make something look uh for example naked or innocent or something to make it look healthy when actually it isn't and so getting young people and everyone and the public the general public to understand that this isn't just about you know what we're eating here it's about our walk to school what do we get advertised to what's on my street that says to me this burger is better than the healthy food that i'm supposed to be eating at school what is it about this you know cereal packet that why is there cartoons on it and getting young people to really question and understand this is more than just you know um having chicken and chips it's actually a whole system that's in place to make me not eat healthily um, and, and getting young people to change that as well. And I really, really think young people are, are the center of this because if you don't get young people to campaign on this by themselves, no matter how much you know you get um, adults involved and adults to push stuff, if the young people don't understand and don't feel involved, there's, there's no point doing it because they're just gonna reject the change. Um, so yeah, that's what our, our, our campaigns are about. Next slide, please. So the framework around food, that picture over there of the young person uh, drinking uh, a fizzy drink, I got from a, um, the, the first thing I typed up when I, when I searched up food and young people, it was one of the, um, in, the in the article, it was one of the pictures. And it, it shows to me that still today, um, the narrative is that it's young people's fault that they eat unhealthily and that it's young people, it's the individual's fault that they have bad nutrition and that they're twice as likely to develop obesity and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's their fault when it, it, it isn't. We all know here that it's a systemic problem. And so I think really when we're um, talking about food and we're talking about nutrition, we need to ensure that we're using the framework to, to insinuate that it's a systemic problem instead of an individual one. Because as soon as you put blame on, on a young person, they immediately reject um, the conversation. And I know you all know that it's not enough for a child to be fed. Nutritional inequality must be addressed, um, but it has to be addressed in mainstream conversations. So when the free school meal um, uh, problem arise in mainstream media, it was on the BBC, it was on ITV, but there was no conversation around nutrition. It was all about um, there's child hunger in the UK, which is obviously correct. But if, if the child that is hungry is being fed uh, poor quality food, they are still at a disadvantage and they are still, you know, 
completely it's it's still wrong and so um i think even in mainstream conversation when we get interviewed by the media when we get we need to emphasize nutrition because then you know uh people can get away with doing the bare mi minimum when children deserve more and they deserve um the, the most nutrition they can get no matter who their parents are what socioeconomic economic background they come from uh, so I've said this before, young people are only just starting to be included in these conversations. You have to start talking with us, include us in, in these um, uh, meetings, include us in the decision making. I think that um, if this doesn't happen and if young people's voices are neglected, there is no way we can move forward because at the end of the day, um, when, when it's our turn to you know, be the policymakers and be we're not going to be healthy enough to do all that or we're not going to have the understanding or whatever so I think it is so 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 essential to include young people and our insight as well I think um if it wasn't for myself or Marcus Rashford or whoever this wouldn't be a, a topic young people at the forefront talking about their experiences is so 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 important um the information gaps um and I, I put in brackets uh J-O syndrome which which counts for Jamie Oliver syndrome. Jamie Oliver is the co-founder of Bite Back 2030. And um, for those in the UK, they, they will know that he did a campaign 15 years ago to ensure um, healthier foods in, in um, parliament, it, sorry, in schools and in schools. And so he got rid of turkey Twizzlers, he got rid of burgers, he got rid of all these unhealthy foods and young people hated him. They still to this day, like whenever they, you know, hear about what I'm doing, they're like, why, you know, why do you like what Jamie Oliver's doing? Because no one was talking to the young people about what was going on. And again, I'm just reiterating the same point, but because they weren't brought along on this journey, I think I'm pr probably the only person under 20 that, that's a teenager in this call. There needs to be more of me here, because if we don't understand what's going on, we're just going to hate the outcome. And so we need to go on the journey to understand why nutrition is good for us. It's not taught in schools. Um, when we do get lunch at break time uh, or at lunchtime, it's it's just a plate of food. There's no there's no journey of the food. We're not taught about it. And so I think, um, yeah, the information gap has to be solved. Um, and yes, be mindful of young people's experiences. I went to a girls' school. And one of the um, biggest issues, in my opinion, uh, is the issue of uh, eating disorders and how to talk about it. Young people go through so much, you know, it's it's a period of time where we're all um, growing and battling with so many different things. And so if we're not talking about the opposite end of the spectrum, you know, what are we not eating? Um, why are we not eating it? And if we're not being considerate about that, it's going to be really, really difficult to um, communicate with young people. Us at Bite Back, we're still trying to understand this and still, you know, talking to our young people, trying to understand the framework around this conversation. But we need to address the things that we tend to not address when we're talking about nutrition. A lot of a lot of girls specifically don't want to eat. And um, I think if we're trying to ensure the health of every young person, we need to um, include uh th these issues as well when when we talk about nutrition um so i think the next slide is just thank you for listening um and i'm really sorry i can't be in the panel conversation i have to drop off um but if you do have any questions please do just find me on twitter or i'm sure dario will give my email so yeah thank you merci 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 uh, christina uh, merci à tous à tous les panelists on, a, on est en terme de nos présentations. Merci à tous les panélistes. On va à la table ronde et à quelques questions, s'il vous plaît, si vous voulez bien. Et la première question va s'adresser à Christina et à Catherine. Quel exemple concret pouvez-vous partager de l'engagement des enfants et des familles dans le processus d'amélioration de la qualité nutritionnelle des repas scolaires qu'ils reçoivent. Quels sont les mécanismes les plus efficaces? Merci. Uh, Christina et Catherine. Yes, Catherine, go ahead. Christina had to leave. Uh, OK. <laughs> Thank you. OK, OK. So, I mean, if, if others want to say something, Carmen, I just saw you turned your video on. If you want to add, you know, just, just go ahead. I think um, 
from, from our perspective, it's definitely important uh, to involve youth. And we heard the very inspiring presentation just now um, from Christine. I, I think it's important that youth are part of the journey because one of the things we um, also um, saw in, in the review of contextual factors is that in the qualitative research, youth um, are not always supportive of nutrition standards and the focus of, of the session is also on, on nutrition guidelines and standards because kids, they, they have developed taste uh, preferences that are not necessarily conducive to, to healthy foods because of the way foods are marketed, um, because of their um, uh, a natural uh, drive to, to salt, sweet, um, uh, fatty foods, et cetera. So we need to involve them from the beginning. Um, and of course, parents play an important role because uh, the, the, the food preferences, taste preferences start at a very young age. So I think Christina's point that she made that youth need to be involved from the beginning are critical. And of course, an involvement um, of the entire uh, school community to make sure we all work, uh, work together towards the goal of, of healthier school meals and, and just school food environments. Christina? Christina is no longer on the call, so if anyone, any other speaker would like to intervene, please feel, go ahead. Um, maybe, ah oh, no, Carmen, go ahead, please. No, 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 I was just saying there's a couple of more questions I think that we had thought uh, here for this session, so, so happy to jump in later. Okay, thank you. No, just from our side, uh, we want also to, to echo what uh, Catherine was saying and also uh, Christina just said it herself. Um, it's basically, it's not how um, we normally as the designers, as, as experts will like to be involved. We really need to start thinking differently and we need to, for example, in this uh, project that I presented, we are having different ways of involving youth uh, through their own means. So we are trying to get to them where they are. Um, we have had different ways, a contest, for example, for videos uh, where they can really let us know what they they like they don't like and what they will actually want to change in their food environments one of the main things that came out from this is the interest on environmental sustainability so food is it's heavily tied to environmental sustainability so we need to understand this uh, this context and uh, not try to to um, reach out to, to let's say uh, the one that the young people that are most that are easier to reach out to we really need to make an effort to go through the most vulnerable to hear and to co-create with them. So I am attaching in the chat a, a new model that we have for food education in schools that was also created by, with uh, different UN agencies. Um, and there you can see how in every step of the way on defining a proper food education curriculum for the whole school uh, involves Is the active participation of the students. <laughs> Merci, merci Christina et Catherine de ces réponses. La deuxième question va s'adresser à Robert et Bruno. Robert et Bruno, quels ont été les principaux défis à relever pour soutenir, maintenir les normes nutritionnelles des repas et paniers scolaires pendant la fermeture des écoles? Merci de répondre à cette question, Robert et Bruno. Should I come in first? Sure. Sure. Um, I, th I think I think there are a few things. The first thing I, I'd say in England, probably a lot of other cases, is that school closures happened uh, very quickly, um, certainly in March 2020 and even in January 2021. And so systems that didn't exist um, had to be had to be conjured uh, fairly quickly um, <clears throat> to ensure that children were, were getting um, support um, and school meals at all, um, let alone um, making sure that the sort of nutritional um, standards you would expect in schools were uh, were, were maintained. Um, and I think I, I touched on this in, the, in my talk, but with the main system that has been um, has been used in England, um, parents have been given vouchers to go and spend in schools now 
there are um, to go and spend in, sorry to go and spend in supermarkets. Um, now there are some restrictions on what parents can can spend that money on, um, but they are you know things like no alcohol. Um, in there, there isn't really much more detail than that. And I think it will be quite hard to enforce, particularly at at speed. Um, and so then you're 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 putting the burden on parents um, to to do the job of schools in, in trying to ensure that the food is nutritious. Now, a lot of parents can do that, but obviously a lot of parents are in difficult situations financially with work and any number of other things, um, the, you know, the, the pressures that people have been under over the last two years. Uh, and so in that environment, it's extremely difficult, I think, uh, to, to try and ensure that um, any sort of nutritional standards are, are maintained. That's been that's been very difficult uh, and and that goes equally I think in the the case of, of food packages that have been sent home and that's been done quite quickly um, but we did see in, in January 21 a very quickly announced lockdown that what was being sent home to children um, for about when one day they were in school and then suddenly everyone was sent home um, often wasn't a, wasn't very adequate it was a big campaigning point on social media it was something that Marcus Rashford, um, who, who Christina mentioned earlier, um, really championed and brought into the public domain and, and it was addressed hopefully quicker than um, it might have been otherwise. Uh, but I would say this is all part of um, working at speed, uh, problems in staff and, and supply chains during the pandemic um, have certainly affected uh, school food and the aim in particular, not just of getting food to, to children, but nutritionally um, valuable food to children so that's I think those are the main challenges we've seen in in the UK and in England in particular thank you merci uh, Robert Bruno tu peux apporter des réponses ok obrigado uh, é, bom para uh, explicar um, um pouco os desafios que o Brasil enfrentou a gente uh, precisa lembrar que com a pandemia houve um problema básico que foi o problema de acesso o alimento, esse é o, é o principal problema, e, e precisava resolver um problema de acesso e precisava uh, dar acesso a uma alimentação saudável, o que garante uma alimentação saudável do Brasil não é o primeiro aspecto é o a, são, é a agricultura familiar e a compra dos agricultores familiares ficou mais difícil também, todos os procedimentos tiveram que ser atualizados é, para um período de emergência. É, então, caiu a compra é, do, da, dos alimentos mais frescos e mais é, saudáveis da, dos agricultores familiares. Então, era necessário retomar essa essa compra. O outro problema, outro aspecto que garante a alimentação saudável é o acompanhamento de uma nutricionista do início ao fim do processo, desde o do recurso que, que o governo local é, pega é, para poder fazer as compras dos agricultores familiares ou dos mercados tradicionais, até a garantir que aquela alimentação que está chegando para o estudante, ainda que seja na, na residência, né, como a, acontece no período da pandemia, na sua casa, é uma alimentação saudável. E o trabalho das nutricionistas também foi... Um, um trabalho comprometido durante a, a, a pandemia. Então, houve uma necessidade de fazer processos de formação, é, de treinamento com as nutricionistas para que o trabalho delas não fosse interrompido as nutricionistas fossem até a casa dos estudantes. Né? E, a partir daí, o terceiro elemento, o terceiro aspecto que faz com que a alimentação escolar é, seja é, tenha esses padrões é, saudáveis de nutrição no Brasil é, a, é a, são as atividades de educação alimentar e nutricional que naturalmente acontecem dentro da escola então foi um terceiro aspecto que precisou ser adaptado a gente é, planejou atividades de educação alimentar e nutricional que pudessem ser feitas dentro das casas dos estudantes pelos próprios pais. Né? Um dos exemplos é a horta escolar, é, que é tradicionalmente desenvolvida nas escolas brasileiras e que foi levada para dentro das casas de alguns estudantes 
com a orientação de nutricionistas, alguns agricultores é, familiares que, junto com os pais e mães desses estudantes, é, conseguiram trabalhar algumas ações de educação alimentar e nutricional dentro da casa é, dos estudantes, né, com algumas adaptações. Então, basicamente, foi, foi isso. O problema de acesso ao alimento, o problema da continuidade da compra de agricultores familiares e a continuidade das atividades de educação alimentar e nutricional. Obrigado. Merci, merci, merci Bruno. Nós vamos passar à última questão, que vai se adressar à Catherine e à Carmen. Quels sont les moyens les plus efficaces d'impliquer de manière significative l'agriculture, l'approvisionnement et les autres acteurs de l'alimentation dans l'élaboration de normes nutritionnelles réalisables pour les repas scolaires? Euh, Catherine et Carmen, si vous pouvez répondre à cette question. Merci. All right, let me, let, me, let me start. And of course, I think all of the topics overlap in what we have been uh, discussing in, in the sense that we need, a, that we need a, a broad participation of several actors in the development of, of nutrition standards and what is acceptable and feasible at the local level, at the school level. Of course, a huge discussion Uh, led by Christina and, and others on, on youth, but there's other constituencies, and I think this question is really important, on you know, how, how do we bring food stakeholders, the producers of food, the ones that are processing food and others, into, into this conversation? I think Melissa earlier mentioned that um, we need to take that into consideration for standards to be feasible. It, it needs to encompass what is being produced locally, what is available locally to be able to first be cost effective, but also the real important opportunity to incorporate more nutritious food in what in the standards and also in what children end up getting uh, in general. So there are specific opportunities, I would say, for this to happen. Uh, In WFP's experience, but I think we've we've all felt it in, in one way or another, the issue of incorporating school management committees, parent teacher associations and farmer groups, women's groups and civil society organizations, we already heard from uh, from from the, the side of youth and, and the, the, the students themselves. But when it comes to others, uh, the school provides a really important environment. Uh, where we already have these groups that are that are constituted that really that form really important constituencies that have to be uh, consulted. As I mentioned, the, the communities as, as a whole uh, really also need to be part of this discussion. Uh, we know that when communities are involved, many of the many of the farmers, maybe many of the associations uh, and, and people that, that are producing the food are also the parents of the children that go to those same schools. So they not only have a stake in terms of their own livelihood, but also because this is what their children will end up eating. So there is a connection there that we need to make and, and be really mindful of how can we consistently involve communities, parents, and uh, the, the different stakeholders around the, the, school, um, the school level. Over. Merci, uh, Carmen. I'll just keep it very short because maybe we can go to a question on agriculture still um, and school food production, which was raised in the chat. Um, I'll just highlight that, of course, working with a range of stakeholders is critical, but also because we are working towards um, addressing all forms of malnutrition, we must constantly also consider mechanisms to safeguard public interest um, and public health and to make sure that we have mechanisms in place to address conflicts of interest. Um, because we need to make sure that the health, that the food provided is is safe and and healthy. So so that's that's a tr tricky point. But um, I'll leave it at that. Maybe we can go to the question on on agriculture. Merci 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 à tous. Uh, merci à tous les panelists. Nous arrivons à terme 
de notre panel. Je tiens à remercier tous les intervenants. Nous Dr. avons Dr. eu une think... très belle appel. Dr. Dia, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I think we have a, um, a point that was raised in the chat uh, that maybe we have some few minutes left to address. And uh, okay, uh, okay. if you allow me, I will go ahead and pose in it because it was uh, quite an interesting one. And uh, I think a participant named Robert uh, underlined the, 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 the potential that schools have to sustainably produce highly nutritious food. And, um, and this activity, uh, th th this fact also provides an extra, an active and engaging educational activity. Yes. Um, so maybe, uh, and he hi then highlighted that schools themselves can produce and should be a determin determining and productive element um, of DIY solutions. So maybe our colleagues at both at FAO and, uh, and maybe also WFP want to um, um, address this, uh, this question, over. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dario, and, and thank you, colleagues. Um, in, in that term, we, well, we only have two hours, so we needed to focus on one of the topics. But uh, as mentioned beforehand, I think all, of, all organizations are working within a broader systemic approach. Uh, in this case, for example, we are placing the school at the center and calling it the school food system mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it has all the aspects of the food environment that, that supply production, uh, procurement, uh, parents, children, the school system. We um, use, for example, uh, we promote the use of school gardens um, in, in different ways. Um, we try not to promote um, school gardens as the only uh, potential supply opportunities because we know that this really depends on the management of the gardens. It should not be on the, on the responsibility of, um, for example, the school staff. It should not be additional responsibility for them or even on the children. It needs to be um, sustainably managed and it needs to have resources because otherwise it, it, it becomes um, an activity that is very difficult to maintain and it can also impede the other aspects of learning. So we um, promote the use of school gardens definitely as live learning platforms. And then there are some uh, instances um, where particularly where the school garden is, is it has productive capacity. It's managed by local farmers and local stakeholders. And it's, it's really, it's a really a well-rounded, um, let's say, commitment and activity. But we we know that this unfortunately cannot be the case in all schools. Not all schools ha have have um, space or um, or the conditions necessary to do that. We try um, to promote where feasible and if not adapt, for example, urban gardens for teaching purposes or to make the linkage, of course, to local smallholder, smallholder farmers. But we need to, to have this, um, it's, it's a contextual situation like always, but we really um, try to ensure that everything that we do in schools is really linked to a systemic um, aspect considering thank you okay thank you then maybe if there's no other uh, comments so maybe i can give the floor back to uh, dr dia for Thanks. his closing remarks merci merci nous allons clore ce, ce panel merci à tous nous avons entendu aujourd'hui parler des preuves euh, des avantages et des leçons apprises auprès des projets et d'interventions qui visent une meilleure adéquation entre les besoins nutritionnels et une alimentation scolaire de qualité. Il est maintenant temps d'agir. Nos enfants méritent non seulement une éducation de qualité, mais aussi des aliments nutritifs, savoureux et produits de manière plus durable. Nous devons entendre la voix des jeunes. Ils sont forts clair et il réclame un avenir viable. Le système alimentaire scolaire est un élément essentiel de cet avenir. Et nos pas scolaires qui sont suffisants et en qualité, mais qui favorisent de meilleurs résultats en matière de santé, d'environnement et de situation socio-économique. Je vous exerce tous a jouer un rôle dans la promotion de ce changement. 
ce soit en tant que chercheur, pour continuer à cimenter les preuves du rôle des normes nutritionnelles dans les écoles, pour aider à lutter contre toutes les formes de malnutrition, ou en tant que participant, pour trouver des moyens programmatiques, programmatiques et les concevoir et de les mettre en œuvre de manière réalisable et spécifique au contexte en tant que conseiller pour préparer et présenter les données probantes de manière à ce que ces données se traduisent par une allocation réaliste et régulière des fonds. Pour, en tant qu'éducateur, pour utiliser l'alimentation scolaire comme plateforme d'apprentissage ou finalement en tant que défenseur de cette approche, pour travailler sans relâche à démontrer le coût de ne pas agir et de multiples avantages d'une approche holistique et systémique pour optimiser l'alimentation scolaire. Je vous remercie.